and Abednego, they realized they were in a terrible position, but they understood who they were worshiping. They realized that we are serving the only God, the God that declared in here to Israel in Deuteronomy 6 and 4. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. They said, We are serving the one God. And we refuse to serve another God. See what's going on in our society and in the world today. We are choosing to worship and serve other gods because your God didn't move fast enough. And I got news for you. God don't move on your time. He moves when he gets ready. Because if God moved every time that we said move God, some of us would really be in a mess. Oh, yes, if he would move every time you say, God, I need you to do something, you probably wouldn't have been as strong as you are now. Something taught you how to be strong. Something taught you perseverance. It taught you how to wait on God. When God sent you through a dilemma, he's teaching you patience. He's teaching you endurance. He's teaching you how to hold on when nobody else is encouraging you. See, you, you know, when you have determination, uh, it brings on some things in your life. First of all, to be determined means to be firm in your purpose. You got to know your purpose. You got to understand, why am I doing what am I doing? Why am I here? Why did God leave me here? Some of you are 60, 70, and even in your age, you ought to ask yourself, why am I here? And I got news for you. There's a reason why you're here. God didn't leave you here just to occupy space and time, but you got something. You got a treasure that's been hidden down in your life. He said, I call the young because they're strong, the old because they know the way. There are some of you that know the way, but you refuse to tell it because you said this generation don't want to hear what I got to say. Tell it anyhow. Sometimes, as a preacher, I know folk don't want to hear everything we got to say. Because everything God sent out is not always good. Come on, talk with me. When I say good, it's not always what you want to hear. Sometimes when God sent the prophet in the Old Testament, they didn't want to see the prophet because they were unaware of what he had to say. Many times when the prophet entered the city, first thing that's the prophet is not what you got from it, what word the Lord gave you. See, old prophets are not like the modern day prophet. Because these modern day prophets, every time you run up to them, they got a word for you. You're going to get a house, you're going to get a car, you're going to get that man. God's going to give you that wife you want. Hello, somebody. But in the Old Testament, when the prophet showed up, they asked the prophet, is all well. In other words, is God all right with us? Are we, have we upset it, God? See, they were understanding that when God sent the prophet, he sent him because he had a word. Not because he was trying to buff their ego or pop them up or pump them up. God had a word. Sometimes when God sends a man of God, the woman of God, it's not because he's trying to make you feel good, pump you up, lift you up. Sometimes he got to dig deep and uproot you a little bit. Yeah. Told the prophet Isaiah, cry loud, spare not, <laughs> lift up your voice like a trumpet. What am I going to say, Lord? He says, show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob. They are seeing. Oh, no, no. Isaiah didn't have a wonderful message. He didn't have a message of, gl of, of glory and hallelujah and lifting your hands and praising God. He had a message that was sending them home, looking at themselves and crying and begging God, what is it that I need to do, Lord? Hallelujah. But when I look at my text, and let me go to that. I'm almost done if y'all don't know it. When you understand your purpose. You ought to get determined, fixed in your mind, that nobody's going to stop me. Because I got news for you. If you're going to run for Jesus, you need a determination. You need a, a, a root down inside of you that will lock you in place, that will feed you in drought and time of starvation. Because you know, when people, you're not doing what they want you to do, they have the tendency to want to starve you out. One preacher told me, he said, folk told him he was sent to pastor a church. 
and the preacher, the folks that had been before him, either were jelly back or didn't have no determination. Because so, they told him, say, we've been known <laughs> to stop preaching. In other words, we've been known to control them. If we don't preach what we want, we'll, you know, put a stop to that mess he's talking about. But see, what you got to be determined here, you got to be determined, I will cry whether they like it or not. And he said the first Sunday he pastored that church and they told him what they, we known to break preacher. He was so determined they wasn't going to break him, he turned 25 out on one Sunday. <laughs> and all of them was his kinfolk. <laughs> See, <laughs> some of y'all don't realize when you get determined, you got to put some folk out your life. You got to put some folk out of your path that's walking with you. I know that's your homeboy. I know, you know, he's your home slicer. You know, you know what y'all call him now. I don't know what they call him now, but you know, your skillet, okay. Uh-huh, he's your home skillet. But I got news for you. Them young people are helping me with service over there. Tell me, Bishop, we don't talk like that no more. But I don't care what he is to you when you get a determination that you want your life to be right before God. There are some people that got to exit your life in order for God to make an entrance. There are some things in your way right now. The reason you haven't reached the plateau of your blessing and your favor with God because there are some things and people that need to get out of the way. Shat, right, Meshach and Abednego, the, the king had done everything in his power to kill their determination, but they were determined to serve God anyhow. What did he do to them, Bishop Cannon? First of all, he brought them in a strange land. And when they came into the land of Babylon, he took away their worship. He tried to change their God. He even made them eunuchs, meaning that he had taken away their manhood and made them in a position that they were not even desirous of another person. But they were determined to worship God. See, sometimes in serving God, there are people that try to take stuff away from you. They try to kill your mentality. They try to work on your mind and get you all broke down in your mind. That's why some people tell you, don't nobody want you but me. The devil lives a lie there, tell you. You done got to be a 16. I remember when you were nothing but a 6, but now you are 16. I got news for you. Don't worry. Somebody loved them 16. But see, you know, it's all about men. They'll tell you how you used to be a six, and now you are 16. But he don't talk about when he used to be a 32, and now he's a 48. You got to be determined. You can't mess with my psyche. You can't mess with my mind. You can say what you want to say, but I'm determined yes, that I'm going through it anyhow. Who glory. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Y'all pray for me. I'm going to take my time. Huh? Sometimes there are demonic forces that are assigned to your life yes, to tear you down. He'll tell you how many times you've been married and divorced and how many times you've been, you know, put out and how many times folk didn't like you, how many folk done quit you and left you alone and how many times you've been up in the house by yourself. But you got to tell yourself in your own mind that I'm determined I'm going to make it in the house. If I have to make it by myself, you don't need all them folk. Sometimes you dragging along folk that's going to kill your destiny. You dragging folk along that's going to bless, that's up your blessing. There's some people designed to mess you up. They're just like old leech. they blood suckers. <laughs> Help me somebody. Some of y'all got some blood suckers in your life. You need to get rid of them, pull them off, set them on fire, burn them, throw them in the garbage, do whatever you got to do to them, but get rid of that blood sucker. They sucking the life out of you. 
Every time you look like you're going up, they pull you back down. Every time you feel like you're going to make it, they go to messing with your mind and you start to feel depressed and down and out. Honey, you don't need that man. You don't need that woman. You don't need that individual in your life because God got a destiny for you. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace. Come on, somebody. He said, I got thoughts that I'm going to bring you to an expected end. See, God's mind for your life is not what your buddy mind for your life. Because, you know, there's some people tell you, I'll never leave you. I'll be with you to the end where they, where they are now. They're gone. Them same folk that told you, I love you forever. You the apple of my eye. You the sweetness in my coffee. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me, somebody. Your coffee dog ain't got no sugar. Not even sweet and low. Because they gone. They left you. They abandoned you. But the Lord is always on your side. That's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were determined because when everybody else fell there, when everybody else left them, it was the Lord that was on their side. Oh, God. I feel like preaching in here. It was the Lord. See, that's why I don't get what nobody said. I'm not going to abandon God. Come on here. Yeah. Y'all talking about you run too much, you go too much, but you got to understand, it's the Lord that keeps me up. Broadcasting, we really hope that you are blessed today by the word of God. We want you to come and join us in a live service. I hope if this service today has been a blessing to you and to yours, that you will write us and let us know that you are blessed by the word of God, that you are blessed by the anointing that was falling in the worship service. And you also can obtain a copy of this service of today by writing us at 601 Clayton Street, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104. If you'd like to receive a copy of this service today, you can have it on CD or DVD. Just write us here at Rice Temple at 601 Clayton Street, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104. And include a donation to help us to continue this broadcast. God has been blessing souls in our service. Come be in a live service and experience the powerful move of God that's on this ministry. I believe that God is moving for such a time as this. We realize that there are crises all over the land. But come and share in here at Rice Temple, AOH Church of God with us. I'm your pastor here, Bishop Gregory S. Cannon. God bless you. Until next week this time, you be blessed of the Lord. And remember, there is a word from the Lord. tuned in to Life Television Network, your number one Christian station. first chapter. <clears throat> and we're going to be talking about 
Words, faith, and things. Say it with me. Words, faith, and things. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, or prevailed not against it. Then we skip down to verse 14, and it says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. Now, Father, we thank you for the anointing upon your word, that it shall be manifest in the lives of every believer that hears and understands this word. And we thank you for it. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for all that shall be accomplished. And everybody said, Amen. Now, notice the scripture says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, over the years, you know, I've heard people say some things about the word of faith message, you know. You hear people say, well, you know, there's more to the Bible than faith. Well, certainly there is. But have you noticed that none of it will work without faith? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because what God has given to us, the promises he's given us in his word, you enter into them by faith through the grace of God. It is only through faith that we have access into the grace of God. And it is the grace of God that causes the reality of the promise in our lives. But now here we have a, a profound scripture that sometimes we just read over it and kind of say, yeah, I know that's in the Bible. But let's read it again. In the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning was the Word. All things began with words. Now, if you read Genesis chapter 1, you'll notice that it says, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. It gets almost monotonous before we get through Genesis chapter 1. Uh, I think 10 times in Genesis 1 it says, and God said. And I was thinking about that one day, and I said, now, Lord, why, you know, why did you say, repeat that over and over? And, you know, it looked like a shortcut wouldn't just say, God said, and then list all the things God said, but he's trying to get over to us what caused creation, words. Remember, he looked out and he saw darkness, and he said, light be, and light was. In other words, he called light out of darkness. It began with words. The power, the life and the power of words is something that, that we really haven't understood over the years, but, but we're learning to, to dig into some of these things and see what causes things to happen. You notice it says all things were made by him. Him who? Him the Word. Now see, if we skip over here to verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Do you realize what he's saying here? In the beginning was the Word, the Word with God. It's talking about Jesus. Jesus was the Word of God. He was the personification of the Word of God. He was the exact expression of God himself. And the word was made flesh, took flesh upon itself and dwelt among us. Now, how did that happen? You read the story in, in, the, uh, in Luke, the first chapter, that the angel appeared to Mary and said, you'll conceive and bear a child. She said, how, seeing I know not a man. Now, she, the, she, she was not in unbelief. You know, doubts, that you can have legal doubts. See, when you just don't know, that's a legal doubt. You just need more information. But when you know what the Word said, then won't believe it. That's not doubt. That's unbelief. Nothing legal about that. <laughs> but she said, how, seeing I know not a man, said the Holy Spirit shall overshadow thee, and that a holy child should be born of these, but called, be called the Son of God. She said, be it unto me. Now listen to what she said. Be it unto me according to thy word. In other words, she said, you found a woman that'll believe you. What if she just said, well, no, I don't believe that. God had to found another woman. She said, be it unto me according to your word. She received the word of God 
by the angel. She left there and went right to her cousin's house and said, he has done great things for me. What evidence did she have? Nothing but the word. She believed it. She received it. She conceived the word in her spirit. It manifests itself in her physical body. In the beginning was the word. All things began with words. God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. Let them have dominion. Over the fish of the sea, the fowl there, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing. Well, now how are them going to have dominion? <laughs> the same way that him had dominion. I know that's not good English, but it'll help you understand it if you pull those words back in there. Through faith fell words. When God looked out and saw darkness, see, you only get two verses into Genesis. You see God calling things that are not as though they were. Now, we're going to get into that tonight. Don't miss tonight. Because we're going to go through the Scriptures and show you some, under, some, some places in the Scriptures where the, the profound principle of the Bible has been overlooked by many, many down through the years. It's called the principle of calling things that are not as though they were. Been small wars fought over faith and confession. You know, somebody said, well, if you say it, anything other than what is in reality, you're just lying. No, you're calling for what is not. Calling for what the Word promised but is not yet manifest. And, and I got to get off of that because I'll get sidetracked. But, but don't miss tonight. <laughs> <clears throat> Now, here we see that all things were made by words. Now, Jesus was a personification of the Word of God. And in the book of Colossians, it reveals that he upholds all things. Now, turn with me there, if you will, to Colossians, the first chapter. Because as you tie these together, it helps you understand it. Now, in Matthew's gospel, the, the, while you turn into Colossians, in Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter, Jesus said, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, and notice the phrase, understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catches away that which was sown in his heart. Now, Mark's Gospel records it a little different, because Mark failed to pick up on what Matthew caught in that phrase, understandeth it not. Mark said, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, then cometh the wicked one, and takes away that which was sown in his heart. Now, if that was the truth, the whole truth, then there wouldn't be much need to hear it, would it? Because Satan would just steal it from you. But you see, Matthew caught something that, that really gives understanding to it. If you don't understand it, the enemy will steal it from you. But if you understand it, he can't steal it from you. I mean, when you understand it and put it in motion in your life, it changes your life. That's why we need to understand every aspect of it. Colossians chapter 1, we'd like to read nearly this whole first chapter, but for the sake of time, uh, let's start with verse 13. Now, back up 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet, or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. God hath delivered us. Say it. God hath delivered me from the power of darkness. Now that word power there, I believe you'll find that it's the Greek word that means ability of darkness, because the, the, uh, the power uh, darkness has no authority at all. It's the ability, and that ability is deception. He has delivered us from the ability of darkness and then translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God. Now, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every cre creature. For by him were all things created. By him who? Him, Jesus, of the Word of God. Now remember, in the beginning was the Word, the Word with God, the Word was God, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and the Word created all things. By him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible, invisible, 
whether there be thrones, principalities, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. So the creation, all creation began with words. From Genesis all through the scriptures you find it. God looked out and saw darkness and said, Light be, let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion. Now, God produced everything, produced is after its kind. And God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. So he expected us to operate in the same principles of the Bible. The power of words are awesome. The greatest power on earth is the power of God's word. And it's never lost any power. It's just as powerful as it was when God spoke it. The problem is, so many times, instead of letting the word abide in us, remember what Jesus said in John uh, uh, 15, verse 17? He said, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask what you will, say what you will, declare what you will, pray what you will, and it shall be done. Now, I'm paraphrasing this. We take, you have to take more scriptures to get all of that in there. But you see, if you incorporate the teaching of Jesus concerning that, that's all in there. Matthew 21 22, all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. In other words, you're only limited to what you can believe based on the authority of the Word of God. In other words, if you can find it in the Word of God, there's enough faith in that scripture to cause it to be manifest in your life. So you're only limited by what you can believe based on the authority of that word. Mark 11, 24, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So we're talking about words, faith, and things. What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them. Now, if God didn't want you to have things, that he had given you, why didn't he tell you how to get them? The things God has given us. Second Peter chapter 1 tells us he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises, these words, you might be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, you don't have to be, but you could be. You might be, if you, if you take hold of that word. Now, Mary received the word of God. She believed it. She received it in her spirit. She went, the first thing she did was go and tell her cousin that God has done great things for me. That word manifests itself in her body. And we read here where it says, And the word was made flesh, and the word took upon itself flesh and dwelt among us. God's word produces after his kind. Now let's go over to a scripture that's very familiar with us. Hebrews chapter 11. And I know sometimes we think, well, we've got everything that's in there, but we might find something there that's interesting. Where Paul says, Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What did Mary hope for? She hoped for what God had said and given to her. Now hope, you see, is out in the future. But you see, that word produced faith. When she began to say what God said to her, faith cometh to hear it. Now, the Apostle Paul says, tells us in the 10th chapter of Romans, he says, the word is nigh thee. Now, listen to what he says. The word is nigh you or near to you. As his, in other words, it's as close to you as getting it in your mouth and speaking it into your heart. Now, I'm paraphrasing it. That's for uh, that's St. Charles' translation. <laughs> The word is nigh you. It's first in your mouth, then it gets in your heart. And when Mary heard the word that came from God by the angel, she first said, How seeing I know not a man? But when, when he explained it to her, she said, Be it unto me according to the word of God. 
She said it with her mouth. She heard it with her ears. Now, we really have two sets of ears. Do you know that? We have the outer ear and the inner ear, and we have the middle ear. But we're talking about two of them. The inner ear is made up by bone structure inside the head. And the words that you speak are picked up by the inner ear and fed directly into what the Bible calls the heart, not the blood pump, the core, the center of your being. It's what motivates you. The word is nigh you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Then in Romans 10, 17, Paul said, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, in the preceding verses there, he said, The word is nigh you, it is in your mouth, and it's in your heart. That is the word of faith which, which I preach. In other words, it's not in your neighbor's mouth and in your heart. He didn't even say it's in your pastor's mouth and in your heart. He said it's in your mouth and in your heart. Now, there's something there that we, we've missed, I think, because uh, it's true you can get some faith and certainly some knowledge from hearing what your pastor says or what I say from the Word of God, but there's something that changes you when you start saying what God said. It's the beginning of a miracle to get the Word of God, the promise of God, manifest in your life. Now, if you remember how Jesus taught, he always talked about things that people understood. He talked about sowing seed and reaping a harvest. The parable of the sower. The sower soweth the word. So it's obvious that the word of God is the seed, and the way you sow it is by saying it, because he said the kingdom of God is if a man cast a seed into the ground, and it should spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. You don't really have to know exactly how it does it. You just know what he said to do and do it. You remember at the marriage of Cana of Galilee, <laughs> Mary, the mother of Jesus, preached one of the most profound sermons in the Bible. They said, we're out of wine. And she told Jesus. And then she said to the disciples or to the as yes, the disciple says, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. She did learn one thing, that he knew what he was doing. And he was anointed to do what he was doing. Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, folks, there's a sermon in that that I don't have time to preach this morning. But whatever Jesus said in the Word of God, just simply do it. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Remember Jesus talking in Mark eleven twenty three. Now the 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 beginning of that story was that he was hungry and he saw a fig tree fall off and he walked over there to, to to get some figs, and there was no figs on it. And see, in Israel they tell me that that when a tree uh, had its leaves year round, it usually bore fruit year round. And and he said nobody will eat fruit from there hereafter forever. And he said it loud enough that the disciples heard it. Words. What we're talking about, words, faith, and things. How words change things. Faith, filled words, changes things. Well, the tree withered and died, and they came back by the next day, and they asked him about it, and he said, uh, have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith? He said, verily I say unto you, or verily, verily, truly, truly I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, now he starts talking about a mountain. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, and listen to it, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Didn't say he'd have what he prayed. Said he'd have what he said. Now, there's a truth there that sometimes we've skipped over. Your saying can nullify your praying if you don't keep your saying in line with what you pray. Three times he says, say in those scriptures, and one time believe. You have to preach more on the saying than you do the believing. Because so many times people believe all right, but they don't say anything. 
Now you have to realize that, that the hearing of the word generates faith. And I'm going to show you why and, and how it does that in a little bit. We're talking about that in just a little bit. But he said, whosoever shall say. Now somebody said, who will that work for? Somebody said, the work for whosoever. No, won't just work for whosoever. It only works for whosoever dares to say and believe and doubt not in his heart and believe what he's saying will come to pass. Now, I'm glad he said doubt not in your heart because, you see, if he said doubt not in your head, there'd been no mountains moved in this life because you can't believe your head what you can believe with your heart. But when you start saying what God said in his word until it causes faith to come, and it abides in you, then you can believe things with your heart or your spirit you can't believe with your head. In fact, your head will give you trouble a lot of times over what you know on the inside. Remember, Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will, and it shall be done. Pray what you will, it shall be done. You can decree what you will, it shall be done. Job said, decree a thing and it shall be established to you. The things you decree and speak with your mouth establishes it to you. It's what puts it on the inside of you. That's why Jesus said it must abide in you. It's not enough just to know what he said. It has to be on the inside of you until you believe more in what the word said than what you see with your natural eye. The word is nigh you, Paul said. It's in your mouth and in your heart. The more you say it, the more you believe it. Words is what determines what you believe. Whether it's written word or whether it's spoken word, but the spoken word seems to be more powerful. Now, remember just, you know, when you were going to school or when I was going to school anyway, they had us quote the multiplication tables over and over and over until we knew them by heart. They knew back then that what you say long enough will get in you. And then you don't have to, you know, get your pencil out or, or get your oranges out and apples and count them to, to do multiplication because it's in you, it abides in you. But so many times people know what the Word said well, yeah, I know the Bible said give and it shall be given unto you, but, but I gave and here's what happened to me. And they cast out the word in favor of first experience 4-7. <laughs> now, that's a dangerous thing to do. But the word said give and it shall be given unto you. Yeah, but my car broke down when I gave more. Yeah, Satan came to steal the word. And if he can get that word out of you, and if he can get you off the word, see, don't cast out the word in favor of experience. Stay with the word of God, regardless of what happens to you in life that never changes the word of God. The word still says the same thing. But if you'll say what God said in his word concerning the circumstances of life, eventually it will change what happens to you. And you'll live out the reality of the Word of God. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're talking about words, faith, and things. God's Word gets in your heart and produces faith for the things that God has given you. Now, the way that gets in your heart, it's in your mouth, and then it's in your heart. The Word is nigh you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Now, let's go over to, to Romans the third chapter. Let's talk a little bit about the law of faith. Faith is a law. Paul talked about faith being a law. I'm glad you could join us for the Concepts of Faith broadcast today. Now, before we leave the broadcast, I have a tape offer this week that I'm excited about. Uh, we, we've talked about words, faith, and things. Now, we have a two-tape series that's called Words, Faith, and Things, a uh, two-tape album it's, it's called Offer Number 2251, and it's $12 plus $3 postage and handling, total of $15, Offer Number 2251. Now, this little album, it doesn't look like there's two tapes in it, but there is. And in this album, we talk about how words, God's Word, produces the faith 
for the things that God has given us. Now, I get amused at the faith critics sometimes. They say, uh, well, you know, these faith folks think that all there is to the Bible is faith. Well, certainly there's more to the Bible than faith, but have you noticed that none of it will work without faith? It's impossible to please God without faith, the Scripture says. Now, in this two-tape series, we point out the fact that it is God's Word that produces the faith for the things He's given us. Now, we're not talking about something God doesn't want you to have. We're talking about what God's already given you. Second Peter chapter 1 says, God hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him that's called us to glory and virtue. And it says, through the exceeding great and precious promises, by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, it didn't say you would be. It said you might be. And it's through faith. God's word produces a faith for the things that he has given you. Now, we know Jesus said, Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not in his heart, believe what he's saying will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. But see, the key there is you've got to believe it. So words produce the faith for the things God has given you. God's word produces the faith. That's where God's, uh, the faith of God is resident in his word. It gets in you when it speak, you speak it. Paul said it's, it's in your mouth and in your heart. First it's in your mouth, then it'll get in your heart. So this is offer number 2251. It's called Words, Faith, and Things. Now once you get the Word of God in your heart in abundance, you speak words that will cause things to come about in your life. That's offer number 2151. And it's $12 plus $3 postage and handling. God bless you. We appreciate you joining us for the broadcast. Until next time, this is Charles Capps telling you that the devil is defeated, God is exalted, and Jesus is Lord. No matter what the circumstances, what I feel or see. To order the product offered on today's program, send your check or money order to Charles Capps Ministries. Or to place your order on Visa or MasterCard, call 1-877-396-9400. Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Bridger. Grandma, can you come out and play? Sure, Ellie. Oh my, you might want to come here and help Grandma. What's the matter, Grandma? Can't you stand? Oh, sorry, honey. It's my knees. They don't work the way they used to. Does this ever happen to you? Are you on Medicare? You may qualify for a pain-relieving knee brace at little or no cost to you. Call the health hotline to see if you qualify. Our friendly agents are standing by 24-7 to help you. We also have braces for your shoulder, ankle, or back pain. And if you're covered by Medicare, you may qualify for free delivery. Grandma, slow down. I can't keep up. Maybe you can use a knee brace too, Ellie. <laughs> Catch me if you can, kiddo. Call now to get your pain-relieving knee brace. Operators are standing by. Call 800-362-1572. That's 800-362-1572. Again, 800-362-1572. That's 800-362-1572. We believe that all children deserve a bright future and the opportunity to pursue higher education. That's what my husband believed. His beliefs and his legacy have become the mission for the Robert C. Blake Sr. Scholarship Foundation. The R.C. Blake Sr. Scholarship Fund was founded in honor of my father, Bishop Robert C. Blake Sr., to provide opportunities for young people who have the desire to excel and the potential to succeed. As a family, we are encouraging every high school senior that's intending on going to college to visit rcblakesscholar.com to apply and to get more information. My husband loved and believed in you, and so do we.
Welcome to Taking the Kingdom with Samuel and R.C. Blakes Jr. This is an outreach of the New Home family of churches. Taking the Kingdom is the prophetic ministry of Bishop Robert Blake Sr. since 1964. Today, the mantle and mission has passed to his sons, R.C. Blakes Jr. and Samuel Blakes. Together, they are bringing the full gospel to a world dead in religion, teaching the word of God to the saints, raising up powerful churches, and demonstrating the power of the Spirit to a world in bondage. Put Satan on notice. We are... Taking the kingdom. Blessings and favor to you, my friends. What a blessing and privilege it is uh, to be able to come into so many living rooms, hospital rooms, bedrooms, uh, wherever you are, even to those who are behind prison bars. I got good news for you. You may be locked in, but the Holy Ghost is not locked out. God can reach you right where you are. Thank you for tuning in. You are tuned in on the right day for the right word. God has a word that is divinely orchestrated and designed to bring change to your life. I want you to sit back, fasten your seatbelts. We're going into the sanctuary of New Home Ministries, and uh, God's getting ready to bless you. Let's go in. God bless. I'm going to talk a bit about the journey to freedom. We tend to know an awful lot about God blessing the Jews with the journey from slavery to freedom and less about our own. Every January 31st, December 31st, there should be a mass meeting of blacks to Port in New Orleans because literally thousands of us were dropped here into slavery. New Orleans. Some people say in a very trite way, they say, well, you know, we came in different boats, we're in the same boat now. That sounds kind of cute, but that's not reality. So we came on very different boats, very different circumstances. So immigrants came looking for a better place. America was their blessing. Refugees came in desperation, fooled the war, and America blessed them. Mothers came as contract. They worked for somebody, brought them in, they worked X number of years, and they get free. So we came as an enslaved people. No one ship was like our ship. Our ship was full of people being sold into slavery, not delivered into freedom. They had their Red Sea. We had our Atlantic Ocean. They had their port of Egypt. We had our port of New Orleans. Largest port in the world today is from Baton Rouge down to New Orleans, open port. They had their Jordan River. We had our Mississippi River and our Savannah River. Say, so God is older than Genesis and did not stop at Revelation. God is with us even now. The chief blessing for the biblical people was freedom. To not food. Freedom, not status, freedom. When God frees the people, that's the chief blessing. The Bible says, and God said, we thank God for putting his mighty hand and delivering us from sleep. When I was a little boy, the big hero was Jack Robinson. Before that was the NBA, before that was the NFL, it was baseball. Jack Robinson came into white baseball. I say white baseball because it was so there were three leagues. It's four leagues. So there were four leagues. African American leagues, called Negro Leagues, White Leagues, called Major Leagues, 
Latin American leagues and Japanese leagues. They were white, black, Latino, and Japanese. So when we joined, so when we joined the white league, we didn't know how good baseball could be until everybody could play. We didn't come to the Dodgers to learn how to play baseball. We, we, we came starting. We had Jack Robinson, Don Lucas, and Campanella, three black players. We figured we could win it, and, but we would lose to the Yankees every year. That's six games, one, or four games, or three or something. 1955, we thought we could beat the Yankees because we had Sandy Koufax and Drysdale. In the four game series, Yankees couldn't beat two of them. But on the day of the big game, this is the Super Bowl game. Kopex wouldn't pitch. So what's wrong with you? So that's that's your uncle per day. I can't play baseball on that day. That's the day the Lord delivered us. So no ball game, no thing, no money, no private joy is greater than I promise to God and I thanks to God for delivering us from slavery. Our deliverance tends to mean, see, our deliverance tends to mean ham, box, and greens on January 1st and a ball game. But God delivered, said that God delivering us from slavery is a big, that's the Super Bowl of freedom. How many of you knew your grandparents? Raise your hand. Knew your grandparents? Raise your hand. Your great grandparents raise your hand. Great great. Great great great. You kind of laugh because you don't, they are blur. In the first book of Matthew, David to Jesus fought, said 42 generations. Jesus knew 42 generations. We stop at five. So Jesus quotes David, he's for the second degree, his lineage. Moses, 2,000 years older than David. So Jesus talked to Moses like he's his granddaddy, and Moses and Joseph was his dad. Now, follow me now. First, slavery is a kind of blur. See, if I do not know, what the Lord delivered me from, I don't know how to thank him. Wow. Say thanking God for a new car, a new suit, and a trip ain't quite like thanking God for freedom from slavery. Sixteen nineteen, we were brought here in shackles. Not for freedom, but for shackles. He was out on identity. And the worst thing they did was they erased our memory. They erased our memory. When I was a little younger, Grandma would be in there humming, and I didn't know why she was humming. She, she was not a songstress. She'd just be humming. She said, sounds a language Delta can't understand. She'd just be, mm -hmm. no organ, no piano, no riffs, just be humming. I know she could think, though she'd act like she was a scholar. She, she could count like, she'd be making bridge, count X amount of grains of salt, X amount of grains of sugar, a little flour. Like she was counting grains. 
She has to be a mathematician because it always come out just fine. <laughs> and that's why she would shout without, see, grandma could shout without organ. See, if I think, if I think about the goodness of God, I can thank God for his goodness. But if I can't think, I can't think. If I can't think, I can't shout. Many of us got PhDs in irrelevances and trivialities. She could think about how she had come out of slavery. See, if you can think, see, if you can think about God, really think, you really think. Let me put this another way. Someone turn the fan off, please. Turn the air off, please. Now, this is not a shouting sermon, Melvin, because it seems to me that I believe in good gravy. Says shouting is not gravy. Shouting is overflow. Shouting is not good gravy. But unless good gravy has a meat base, it's just greasy water. Say gravy, gravy must have a meat base or it's just greasy water. So, so I'm trying to let a little meat base in. When the Constitution was written in 1776, we had been here 157 years already. So we were here before the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence was written in 1789, so we'd been here 12 years before then. So we were here, we're not at the bottom of the nation, we're at the foundation. Now y'all that's a different. See, the bottom is where you end up. Foundation is where you start from. In other words, if you had a little condominium and you were on the 35th floor, and a stiff wind blew the roof off, you would be upset because the roof fell off. But folk on the other floors, they wouldn't be upset. But if there was a Katrina at the bottom, everything would be shook up. See, when the foundation shakes, everything shakes. We're not the bottom. We are the foundation. That's why we're the issue. The biggest discussion in 1789 was what should we do with them? What should we do with them who are driven our in this cotton to the top of the world? What should we do with them? So Africa provided three things. Take note, so Africa provided three things. The shipping industry for 250 years it provided resources from Africa and cheap labor from Africans. So our four parents are not slaves, they're our ancestors. They're slaves to conqueror. But my great 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 grandmama is not slave, but she's my great great grandmama. Say my great 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 grandmama. It's my great great grandmama. She's not my slave. So I should never again refer to her as slave. Go back with me a minute. The king was cotton. The South wanted to break off and form a whole new nation of cotton and us as labor and shipping clerks. So the shipping clerks founded Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and Columbia in Georgetown. That's what's coming out now and breaking out the news today, breaking news. And then they went a step further. So when we establish our, our, our preeminence as cultivating cotton, 
we became valuable. We're more valuable to our oppressors than to ourselves. See, if today, if today we've gone from picking cotton balls to picking footballs and basketballs and don't own our services, we just shift and pick it. Thirty-two NFL football teams, right? We own none. Thirty-two basketball teams, we own none. Basketball teams, we own one. So picking cotton was not so bad. If we could own the seeds, get the government subsidy, and turn them in the textile, textile, in the clothes, and ship them. We could only pick it. We couldn't develop. So picking footballs and basketball ain't bad. If we can't own it, nothing's changed but the product. <clears throat> Slavery. Illegal to learn to read or write. Slave master got caught raping one of our women. She was his comfort zone. She was his experiment. The husband, or the, the man, she because couldn't have a husband, said marriages and family was illegal. So if he had sex with his daughter or with his wife, he could do nothing about it. There was not one rape technically in slavery. To beat a man, it was his property. See, if they beat the man, they could not protest his property. So you end up with one family with four children, two of them very dark and two of them very light skinned. Look, look around our complexions in this room. We do not look like Nigerians. Like we're from Benin. We look like we're landing in New Orleans. <laughs> so our hair is different. Our skin color is different. So we are a people not based on color, but culture and relationships. So you say, it's all right, said a dark skin, Negro, married, light skin, lady, and vice versa. Because we, so we are a people not based upon complexion based on culture. Jack and I have five children. All seven of us are different colors. And, and, and no one, it, it doesn't affect anybody. So nobody in the house is affected. Seven people in the same house, all different complexions. That's the lineage of slavery. You black men to have sex with black women. To make other little slaves. If they were sick, throw them away. If they were strong, put them to work. I'll sell them. You make a boy and they sell your son. You can do nothing about it. You had no, no right in court. So strong boys pick cotton or sold to the, to the neighbor plantation. Remember Strom Thurmond some years ago, this lady, Miss Washington, went to South Carolina State. She was Strom Thurmond's daughter. They finally put a name on the statue in South Carolina a few years ago. Say, say, say young black girls were comfort zones and experiment for slave masters. So me too should start a long time ago. <laughs> See, in slavery, we could not get a wage. Illegal to get money for work. Had no health care. We got sick. We died. My grandmother, Brother Sam, my grandma, didn't have, a, didn't have a birth certificate because she was the last of 13 children. She was sickly. They thought she wouldn't live, but she didn't deserve to live. So she, 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 with them. she hopped along that she had my mom at 13. I'm discussing the erased, say slavery, erased our memory. Now, just that's too far back. Say every, every cell one of our ancestors 
is downtown in the records in New Orleans. So I'm because on every ship, the, the government taxed the ship and the cargo. Every ship that landed, the product got taxed. You got taxed according to how many products were on your plantation. So if they knew how many of us left West Africa, how many got thrown in the ocean, how many landed in New Orleans, how many went to the sugar plantation, how many went to the cotton plantation. Talk to me, somebody. I want y'all to hear me. I, I know this ain't shop material. I just want y'all to bear with me for a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll let y'all let y'all go and watch the Pelicans or something after a while, but I got I got y'all trapped right now for a minute. So the records that we say we don't know our past, but those who conquered us, those who got free land from the government and tax subsidy from the government and paid taxes to the government, they know. That's, that's, a, that's a scripture that's kind of sad. 137 Psalm saying we went by the rivers of say we went by the rivers of Babylon, and then we wept when we remembered Zion. Said so we were worse off. We don't remember Zion. We, we, we don't remember five generations deep. So that, there's, there's no there's no there there. There's just a there's, there's just a blur. There's just a, a dark spot back there. So some people call say our great 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 grandparents are not our slaves, but our them it will not be us. They are our ancestors, our parents, not our slave. That leads into say everything fundamental to America is based upon slave trade. This is black history, we're gonna sell it the same today. The South's gonna break away. Lincoln said, "I tell you what, if, if, if you don't come back in a hundred days, I'll, 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 I'll take away your, I'll take away your slaves. I'll take away your economy." See, our people were the, the backbone of the Confederate Army because we were cooking while they were working, and we were crops while they were fighting. So Lincoln said, "I'll free them." It was the biggest single blow to the slave system. Lincoln said, in a hundred days, if you don't if you don't bring them back, I will uh, free them. He said, Master the hell if that's true. He said, first we'll, we'll kill him. He said, slaves are not going in. He said, we've had slavery 243 years. It ain't going in on no one moment. This, is, this was a fight going on. Our people have been waiting to hear a president with the full military authority give the order to free us. After all, we were enslaved by the government. So the government protected slave owners. We all better than this minute. Christmas meant nothing to our people because A, you couldn't shop, you had no money. No layaway, no credit card. So you couldn't leave the plantation. So, so the big deal for us was December 31st. Lincoln said, tomorrow, if they've not reconciled, I will free you. The first watch night service was December 31st, 1862. Said, be watched. What, what good guys come to church and pray the next year and bad guys have a private party? Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, I know that that word uh, has affected change in the lives of so many people watching today. That's our aim, that's our desire, not to impress you, but to improve you by the imparting of God's word. Listen, uh, if you're watching today and you're in need of prayer, I want you to sit down and call the number at the bottom of your screen. There were counselors who were sitting, waiting to pray for you and waiting to pray with you and usher you into the things of God. Uh, there may be someone today who's unsaved. 
Maybe you're in need of salvation. I want to pray with you today. I want to pray that God will come into your heart and come into your life and that from this moment on, your life will not be the same. Will you pray with me? Close your eyes. Repeat after me. Father God, come into my heart. Take over my life. I surrender my life to you. I surrender my members to you. I ask you now, God, to forgive me of my sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Make me whole and holy. And I thank you now that from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. My brother, my sister, if you prayed that prayer with me, let me tell you, from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, you're saved, you're saved, you're saved. Now what you need is a good church to help affect change in your life. And let me tell you, one single service at New Home Ministries will change your life forever. I want to see you. Sunday morning, I want to see you in Baton Rouge at 8 o'clock, 3000 Tecumseh Street. 1030, I want to see you in New Orleans at 1616 Robert C. Blake Sr. Drive. I promise you, if you come one time, you will come back again. I love you. Thank God for you. And until next time, if I don't see you here on the air, if Jesus comes back, I'll see you in the air. Bless your spirit. We believe that all children deserve a bright future and the opportunity to pursue higher education. That's what my husband believed. His beliefs and his legacy have become the mission for the Robert C. Blake Sr. Scholarship Foundation. The R.C. Blake Sr. Scholarship Fund was founded in honor of my father, Bishop Robert C. Blake Sr., to provide opportunities for young people who have the desire to excel and the potential to succeed. As a family, we are encouraging every high school senior that's intending on going to college to visit rcblakesscholar.com to apply and to get more information. My husband loved and believed in you, and so do we. listening to WGOK. Well, praise the Lord, friends, and welcome to another exciting edition of our Study of the Word broadcast with Apostle David Kaiser, Jr. A Study of the Word is an evangelistic outreach of rightly dividing the word Church of God, located in Mobile, Alabama. Stay tuned for the next 30 minutes as we take you live into the sanctuary with Apostle David Kaiser, Jr. You be blessed. When you don't know what, who is more important? Y'all, God, amen. And so you could even pray a prayer uh, like this. Lord, I, I'm interested in this area. Uh, but there's something in my spirit that says that there's a certain degree of success that awaits me uh, in this particular area and this particular understanding in Zumba. Y'all got it? And so I need to know somebody who knows Zumba. Because all I have is a desire now. Right? Y'all got it? Amen. And so what God will do when you get in pursuit, he'll put you into contact with somebody who knows Zumba. Y'all got it? And then you get in there and you take the process to the next level. Right? And, uh, and one thing you have to... Now, servant... Servant means someone who was humble enough to be led. See, you can't go on the Zuma class somebody I already know. <laughs> you Zumba. And they that ain't Zumba. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, you can't go in the class. Tell me, I got this. I got this. Let me show you. Let me show you. You're going to be zooming right on out the door. Right, y'all getting it? Right? So, so when God brings you into contact with who you need to know, you got to, you got to take a different posture. 
Right? You got to be grasshopper. Right? And you can't be telling sensei how to kick. Right? You got to be grasshopper. Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? Amen. And you'll be surprised how far your humility will get you. You're getting the gist of what I'm saying? Amen. You can't be jumping in and say, oh, but. No. You just hush and listen. You know, and, and, and most of the time what, what, what your uh, who going to do is start with the basics with you. And some, some people can't stand that. They, they can't be patient enough when, when the who start with the basics. They don't know what you know. Y'all got it? And, and if you're going to see what you don't realize is that when you meet the who, you become a representation of the who when you leave them. You're going to go and say, the who told me. Right? And so they want to make sure that when you leave their presence, you're going to be on the right path. Right? Exactly. You got it. So, so you got to go into those environments with a heart of humility. Y'all got it. Go in there ready to glean and to, and to suck up everything that you can, you can get in that particular uh, uh, first encounter. Right? Y'all got it. Dr. Mike Murdoch said in one of his books, the difference between a season is a person. Say that. The difference between a season is a person. In other words, the people that you allow to come into your life can change the season of your life depending on what they bring into your life. Y'all got it? And that happens sometimes subconsciously and unaware to a person that ain't paying attention. Right? They allow people to come into their lives and before before they recognize it and realize it, that person then changed the whole direction of their lives. They've gone in a whole other direction that God never told them to go in because they allowed somebody to come into their life and change the season of their lives. You got to know when to tell folks, I'm not in that season. That's, I'm not in, that's not my season. You got it? Amen. And so... So we want to be careful, right? Uh, in Joshua 1 and 1, four individuals are mentioned. Moses is mentioned. The Lord was mentioned. Joshua was mentioned. And none, Joshua's father, was mentioned. Y'all got it? All of those individuals were instrumental in Joshua becoming a success. Y'all got it? Now, we know uh, that the Lord was the most important one, and we may talk about that in, in a few moments, you got it. But the Bible said Joshua, uh, and Nun, Joshua, the son of Nun, right? And so what that tells me, and, and whenever you read scriptures and, and it starts talking about genealogy, uh, so-and-so begot so-and-so and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so what it's saying is all of those individuals were instrumental in that, in that family tree. They made significant impact. Y'all, y'all got it to the next generation. And so here, because the Holy Ghost chose to give Joshua's father props, that means he must have raised him right. Y'all, y'all got it. That means he had a positive, uh, indelible impact uh, on Joshua's life. I believe that prepared him for Moses. Y'all, y'all got it. Because Moses wouldn't have just picked anybody. Right? He just wouldn't have picked nobody with their pants hanging down sagging. Right? Because what you have to understand is, is, is Joshua was allowed in the inner circle. Now Moses leading two million people. You got him. But he picked Joshua to be in his inner circle. And, and frankly, size from sister, sister Moses, you couldn't get no closer to Moses than Joshua. Y'all, y'all see that? Amen. And so, 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 so that meant that that his father was 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 significant in his life. The Holy Ghost chose to 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 talk about him. Right? Is is that all right? 
Are, and then, of course, in the Bible it talks about uh, Moses and it talks about the Lord. And so my point is, in every stage of your life, uh, God has positioned certain people to help you to become a success, right? And you need to pray and ask God to help you uh, by way of the Holy Spirit to recognize them uh, when they show up. Y'all got it? In every stage of your life, God has positioned certain people to help you uh, to become a success in that stage that you're in uh, at that particular time. Y'all got it? And, and it's a golden opportunity. You know, I was, uh, oh man. I was considering a, a, a business venture, a venture, and uh, Sister Kyle and I, and I was, uh, I said, it's a golden opportunity. This is going to bless somebody. And as I was meditating on, you know, whether or not I should, you know, dive in on the, on the next level, I turned the television on, man of God, I never saw him before in my life. And he said this. He said, a lifetime opportunity has to be taken advantage of during the lifetime of the opportunity. Did y'all hear that? He said, a lifetime opportunity must be taken advantage of during the lifetime of the opportunity. Y'all got it? And then he said, because God will give you the right of first refusal. Y'all got it? See, if you don't take advantage of the opportunity, what he'll do, he'll give the opportunity to somebody else. But he will give you, he's given all and going to continue to give all of us the right of first refusal. That means he's going to give you the option to say yes or no to the opportunity. And I'm telling y'all, some of y'all in here, God, I've given multiple opportunities. And you, through abdication of making a decision, lost the right to first refusal. And so he said, God will give you the right to first, uh, to, uh, uh, a first refusal. You know, the Bible said, the Bible two or three, we didn't hear that. And the Holy Ghost said, hit me three times in a row, quick. And then he said this. He said, if you don't grab a hold to an opportunity while it's passing by, it will pass you by. <laughs> It'll pass you by. You got it? And I said, oh, Lord, I, I hear you. I heard the voice of God. Even though it came through a vessel I never saw, never heard his voice, but when he spoke, I heard God speaking to me. And, and so I told my wife, you know, the Lord said, don't, don't let this opportunity pass by. And for me to take advantage of the opportunity during the lifetime of the opportunity because I have the right of first refusal. And I know it's first refusal because when it was presented to me, they said somebody else came up in their mind, but God spoke to them about me. Y'all right right. got it? Amen. And so uh, my point, God have people stationed along the, every area of your life, every, every dispensation of your life, and you got to stay sensitive so you can, you can hear and recognize those people when they show up because they're there. Y'all got it? They are there. Amen. Now listen, some of these people you will have a relationship with. Some of them you won't. And, uh, you know, can I confess? That part right there used to bother me because I used to want to have a relationship with the people that I felt like could pour into my life. Am I helping anybody? And, and I found out that, you know, sometimes God will have people to pour into your life and, and, and you won't even be able to get close to them. You won't be able to get close to them, right? But you got to be able to recognize, though, even though I can't get as close as I want to, God using that person to speak to me and to minister into, into my life. Y'all got it? You know, I found out that, that you know, Successful people can only have so many people in their inner circle. So many, they, they, you know, that's just the way it is. You, you got it. It came to a point in time where 
where the crowd, the people in the crowd couldn't get as close to Jesus without going through the inner circle. They had to find somebody in the inner circle and tell them to go in and ask Jesus could they have an audience. And people get, they get a problem with that. You know, I just can't walk in past the door. I usually could walk in the church and just, and just go in past the office. Well, well you know, sometimes you get to a point where you, cannot, you can't do that no more. That don't mean pastor getting high-minded or looking down his nose. Got Alex out there. He's bigger than the door. You know, you can't get by. I said that, and Alex knew exactly what I meant, didn't you? I said that in a positive. That was, that was male affirmation. That's, that's what that was. It was which, you knew it. You knew it. You knew it, didn't you? You knew it, didn't you? you knew it. That was male affirmation. That was not a put down. So don't be rubbing on Alex Beck. Yeah, like, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. He didn't mean it, Pastor. He didn't. He just say anything. <laughs> Lord have mercy. <laughs> he understood exactly. He's saying, yeah, Pastor. <laughs> yeah. No, I am. I ain't. That's all with it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I know that's right. That was male affirmation. So, so listen, some people... <laughs> That's just this guy. She, she, she a loving person. And, and, you know, sometimes you don't think I'm as loving. But I am. I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she, I had to defend myself because she in the truck. I'd be getting it all with. Well, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> I can't believe you said that. And I'm like, the boy all right. I'm telling you. <laughs> Lord, how mercy. Where am I? We was a far off or a strong close. Yeah. All right, so some of them you have, these people, the who's in your life, some of them will have, uh, you have a relationship with and some of them you won't. And, and that's important because perhaps some of you were like me thinking that anybody that God uses to, 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 to bless your life or to give you instructions as it relates to being successful, you always have a relationship with them. You got it. And that's not always the case, and you can't be offended about that. Y'all got it? Uh, listen, some of them will be saved, and some of them won't. Y'all got it? Because one of the things God has had to do, you know, over the years is drop certain biblical wisdom in ungodly vessels. Y'all okay. got it? Because perhaps it may not have been anybody in the kingdom that was ready for it. Okay. You got it? I believe he does that quite often in, in the area of science and, and medicine and, 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 and inventions and all of that kind of stuff. Y'all got it? Because a lot of times, you know, the world will be wiser than the children of of, of, of God because they're always after something, trying to find out something, trying to... I wonder what's down there in that hole. Right? It's dark down there. It's deep down there. Throw a rock in there. Don't want to hear it hit bottom. I think we ought to go down there, right? <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. Right? But somebody going down there, and they're going to find out, they're going to come back, they're going to do a documentary, and they're going to tell you what's down there. The third person, okay, <laughs> going to do the document. But, but, but listen, sometimes they'll be saved, and sometimes they won't be saved, right? And you got to be all right with that. You know, sometimes God will teach you some things through an un unsaved vessel. See, if you know the word, though, you know where they're getting off, right? But don't not get what you need. Y'all got it? Amen. Somebody say, get what you need. And I got this on him. Please understand this. They will not be there to do the work that only you are supposed to do. 
in order to make you a success. Y'all, y'all got it? Because some people have that mentality. They think when, when the who show up, they're supposed to do all the work. You got to make you a success. And who is saying, listen, I've already done that work once. I ain't even do it no more. Right. This is how I did it. And this is what you need to do. And I'll come back and I'll check on you to see whether or not you're doing it correctly. But I'm not going to do it for you. Y'all got it? And, and you'll be surprised. The more they see you uh, uh, invest yourself, the more they'll be willing to communicate to you. And every now and then they might put their hand in it too and help you do this or to, or to, or to do that. You got it, but you got to invest yourself in your own success. Somebody say it. I have to invest myself in my own success. That was pretty good, right? So Joshua had his father to pour into his life. He had Moses to pour into his life. And he had the Lord to pour into his life. And of course the Lord uh, was the most important one of the three. And he will always be the most important person uh, that we need to have to pour into our lives. You got it? Uh, you have to be careful about, and I'm closing, about success. Go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8. I think in 18. Or is it 18 and 8? Let's see. And uh, because what the enemy will try to do when you become successful, I think it's 8 and 18. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He'll try to, he'll try to cause you. And I know this kind of stuff never enters your mind, you know, that when I get stable, when I become successful, that I'm going to forget about God. I'm going to forget about the things of God. And um, sometimes success can cause you to become so focused on your success because being focused is one of the principles that breeds success, right? A diligent man shall abound with blessings, the Bible says. And so what that means is that when you get after something, you, you focus in on it. You all in. You're not half in. You got it. Amen. You got a direction to your life. You won't be deterred, you know. And so, and, and you got to have that, but you have to be careful that you don't allow that to get out of control. Because you can get so focused on your success or being successful until you forget about God. And, and forgetting about God is not, I just, I just forgot about God. His importance in your life begins to, to you will begin to wane. Is that is a good way to say that? Yeah, he's not first place no more in your, in your life. You, you got, and that's, that's, that's real subtle, subtle. Yeah, y'all got it. But the enemy has used that, and he continues to use that on those who are not aware of his tactics, right? Deuteronomy 8 and what? And 18. He says, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Man. God knows the end from the beginning. Right? I don't care how they say, Lord, Lord, we ain't going to never, and I know that's bad, we ain't going to never forget about the Lord. Oh, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? Y'all, 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 y'all got it. And people confess that, they testify that, they say all that kind of stuff. But as soon, sometimes, if they get to that place of stability, and they got it clicking, they got it going on, Man, they start forgetting about the law. They never denied that they were the children of God. Y'all got it. But in their actions, God said, you done forgot about me. You done forgot about me. When you were making minimum wage, I couldn't beat you to church. Now, God was first place in your, in your life. 
Now they want to take it up to $15 an hour. Ain't the Lord good? That ain't no money. Yeah, not, not from the perspective of what you want out of life. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't be grateful, you know. But I'm just, yeah, right. That You know, $15 an hour, you, you, you know. And, and, and God said, look, I don't look down through time. And, and I decided to warn them about something that he knew they were going to do. Hmm? Verse 18, this is why I am. It says, but thou shalt remember the Lord, thy God. For it is he, oh, Lord. Now, remembering the Lord don't mean I remember the Lord. No, that means... You get on up, you come to the house of God, you right, you invest yourself in the things of God, in the kingdom of God, in the house of God. Uh, 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 yeah, that's that's what he. That, that don't mean you remember the Lord. You stop paying your tithe. and you believe in God for more, right? But he said, "Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God." For it is what? Lord, have mercy. That what? That giveth thee the power. You know, see, success will never be by your own might and by your own power. Right? If, if you acquire any degree of success, it's going to be because God gave you the power. That's why I say, I don't understand that. You know, God will give you the power to go to the job. And he won't give you power to come to church? Right, right. Yeah, you do. You know, and you need to quit using me as an excuse. Pastor don't know I'm tired. You probably was tired when you went to work this morning, but you went. Mm, and worked. And God gave you the power to do that. Right? But we'll talk ourselves into... But he ain't got no more strength. God ain't got no more power left. When I clock out, the power done turned off. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Y'all, okay. Say, so, is he to give thee the power to get wealth, right? That he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. Y'all got it? So, so a part of your wealth is to help establish God's covenant, you know, in the earth. I, I'm creating a, a, um, a post-cross prayer for you guys. And I'm going to put it to, to some music to it, and you can, we're going to record it if you want it. Amen. You can play it in your, you know, just to get post-prayer praying in you. Believe it. Thanking God for all the things he's made available for you in Christ Jesus. Y'all got it. And at the end of that prayer, as I was kind of wrapping it up the other day, the Lord, and I put in there about believing for all of these things that God, the manifestation of all of these things that God has said he's already given up in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Ghost had me to put in there. Uh, oh, hi. I'm Co-Pastor Ann Cosby, right in the Biden Word Church, and we would like to invite you to our 2017 Sister Sweet Must Stay in Women's Conference, which will be held right here in the beautiful city of Orange Beach, Alabama, at the Career Resort. So I would like to take this time and invite you to come. The dates are September the 14th through the 16th, 2017. That's right, so be sure to come and join us. The ladies at Rightly are already making preparation just for you to have a wonderful time in the Lord, fellowshipping with other sisters in the Lord. So stay tuned and our announcer will give you some pics from last year. So be blessed. Ladies, it's that time again. Time for the Sisters We Must Stand Women's Conference 2017. This year's conference will be held once again at the beautiful Carib the Resort in Orange Beach, Alabama. We invite you to come join us September the 14th through the 16th at the Carib for our wonderful time in praise, worship, and fellowship. We will have five dynamic speakers that are seeking a word just for you, woman of God. So grab your family and your friends and reserve your condo now. To register for your conference seat, call 251-433-0121 
or contact your Wrightley representative. To receive your conference discount, you must register by August 20th. Sisters, we must stand 2017. See you there. have just been blessed by studying the word broadcast with Apostle David Kaiser Jr. If you would like an audio or video copy of today's message, please email us at rdtwtvpros at gmail.com. Connect with us daily on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or Ustream to catch past shows, words of encouragement, special events, or join us live in the sanctuary. We're located at 760 Ermira Street in Mobile, Alabama. Our service times are Sunday school at 9.30 a.m., Sunday morning worship at 11 o'clock, and Tuesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. Join us at this same time next week for a study in the Word broadcast with Apostle David Kaiser, Jr. You be blessed. Life Television Network, Chickasaw, Mobile, Preacher. new home for news and talk 660 WXQW